We're here with special guests Robin DeRosa, Steele Wagstaff, and Amanda Coolidge for a Q&A on best practices when making open textbooks with students. First one I see is from Michelle Reed, um, who has a few questions for you, Robin. The first is, have you encountered any resistance from students in making their work open? And do you provide an alternative for students who may not want to work in the open or license their work openly? Um, yes, so I, I, I wouldn't say I encounter resistance, meaning people who are, because that's a, like kind of an angry word, I think, like, so I don't think I get resistance because I don't force people towards the open. So there's no reason to get mad at me. <laughs> um, so I give them the option of staying in the LMS. And um, I have had in the three courses where we really worked open um, in significant ways, I had just one student who chose to remain fully in the LMS. Um, but I do have some pretty sophisticated uh, privacy options, or not so much privacy, but anonymity options. So for example, I make sure when we uh, buy domain space, and I've done this in a few different ways now, I have domain of one's own at my institution, but before that we were purchasing independently. So we would always make sure that the students understood what domain protection was and we would get domain protection and students would have the option of um, blogging or writing or creating a web space under a pseudonym. So for example, in, in the early American Lit class, I had a guy who uh, his pseudonym was easily annoyed blogger. And his whole thing was like, let me tell you what's annoying about Thomas Jefferson. And he actually developed this little follower. And then later he was like, I kind of want to say who I am because I'm like famous now <laughs> for my annoyed blogs. Um, so I think you can have stages, you know, you can also have people who might want to be in the open, but they don't really want to develop their own digital identity attached to their real identity. But if you're going to allow that as an option, you just have to make sure you understand enough about how privacy works on the web and data so that you're not offering them some false sense of privacy that isn't actually authentic. Um, but yes, I, I give students a choice. Uh, they, are, they have the choice about whether to openly license their work or not. And if they do choose an open license, they have the choice of which license to choose. Uh, what that means is that occasionally a student may not get in the textbook um, because they may not have, so I actually won't use CCND um, stuff in my books. So if a student chooses to use an ND license, like super awesome, uh, but we won't build with that because we're using mostly the um, other licenses. So I, I don't think there's any problem giving them all of that choice. It only works to reinforce the open pedagogy, I think, which is that you are in the driver's seat and you have control over, over what you do. I think there was another um, little part of that. There was a follow-up asking about the administration and what their reaction was in a first-year seminar um, to doing something new and open rather than something controlled. So, so a couple things. First of all, like we now have domain of one's own. So they were sort of okay with some of it, right? Because like now we're moving more institutionally towards open. Um, but I will tell you that OpenSEM, uh, the seminar course that we had the open textbook for, I ran that as a radical experiment in open pedagogy. So the whole course had a very, like, sort of a lot of open pedagogy. So one of the first things we did is I brought the learning outcomes that were required for that course across all courses. Um, and I don't have any choice about those learning outcomes. Um, and instead of just sort of like shoving those on the students, I brought them to the students. I said, I don't have any choice. What do you think of these? What should we do? So basically we built the course as a group, given the constraints that were already in place by, for example, um, the first year seminar program. That could also be the constraints that are in place by, for example, accreditors or by a department curriculum. So I think offering to students the realities under which their education is being built and helping make those explicit is very helpful. So we weren't able to just be like, in this course, we want to study marshmallows and talk about whatever, you know, there were learning outcomes. We talked about what they were, and then we talked about what we thought were the best ways to meet them. We also added a number of learning outcomes that were not original to the required learning outcomes. So one of the ones they really wanted to add was they thought, um, being able to work outside of your comfort zone was a key skill that was necessary for surviving um, college. So we built that as a learning outcome, which meant we also had to learn how to measure 
comfort levels. And then we had to design assignments that pushed you out of them. Um, and they did sort of all of that work. So I would say that whatever constraints that you have, you can work open under those constraints as long as you, you know, present them to the team that's involved and get creative about how you, how you deal with them. Great. But and I noticed I, the next, oh, go ahead. I, I actually wanted to raise my hand and say, I have a couple of thoughts that are very connected to Robin's answer and the initial question. And I think these were important considerations for me and for us as we were setting up a project in which students would be writing uh, an open resource. And I think my perspective is that thinking about rights or student rights in two ways mattered to me. One is that they had they have a right to privacy and in the united states it's federally mandated through FERPA, so that we should for not, now for now yes. <laughs> i could, yeah who knows what the future holds but we should not uh, identify them as being a part of the course for example so like if we produced an open resource we shouldn't say this was produced by english 212 at whatever without express a bunch of different ways that we can accommodate this. We can ask them for FERPA waivers. And so some institutions have developed FERPA waivers that students would sign and say, I give my permission to do this. We can leave the course unidentified and just make an open resource and say, these people contributed and don't say that it was built for a particular course, which is not hard to do. Or we can, and or we can allow them to use pseudonyms as, uh, as Robin indicated, or all of the above. And that's, I think, understanding a little bit more about student privacy rights, what our own ethical position is about protecting student anonymity. I know for myself, when I was in library school, I had an experience where we had we were required for the course to write a public blog in which we respired and responded to a bunch of questions. I thought a lot of the questions were dumb and I had to do them for the course. And so I'm like, my name's being attached to questions that I think are kind of dumb. I don't want my opinion on this being public. I just have to do it for a course. And as soon as the course was over, I was more than happy to delete that blog and a lot of the things that I had to write for the course. If there were other options available to me, I would have availed myself of them. I didn't complain loudly about it at the time, but I know how that affected me and my own, my own thoughts about that instructor in that particular experience. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that they have, they have copyright to whatever their intellectual property is. And we're encouraging them to uh, license their work under a particular license that is for the public good but it's ultimately their right and their decision. And part I think of open pedagogy is empowering them to feel like, hey, this is your content. What do you want to do with it? Whatever they make or write, they, they, the copyright originates in them and with them until they decide to license it otherwise. So when publishing an openly licensed book, our, our strategy was that we wanted to obtain consensus on the license that contributors assigned. And uh, I encourage CCBY, and I think the Rebus community is encouraging CCBY, but we also then would want to say uh, the BY part is by attribution. So we're giving students hopefully a, a, a education and some empowerment about how they would like to be attributed when someone else cites or quotes both the work in the entire or their contributions to the work. So it's, this is a little bit more complicated. Sometimes tools allow for things, sometimes tools don't. In the case of Pressbooks, works entire can be licensed under a, an, a, a, the same license, but individual Parts of it can be licensed under variable licenses. I don't know that I'd rec necessarily recommend doing that. I think it's probably best for the work as a whole and for everybody's sanity to have the group reach some consensus about the overall license of the work, but also make it very clear that not everyone's required to contribute their work to that license and they can still get credit for the course or for whatever the educational goals are if they choose to license their work or not license their work differently. And those are the two rights that I think were really important that we wanted to stress to our teachers who were encouraging students to do this. That, and I think that's pretty similar to what you were saying, Robin, as well. And it sounds like we're going to Amanda. Yeah, I was just going to say I completely agree with that. And one thing I think that's really important, and especially more so now, given the current climate of the world, is this opportunity for um, as we engage faculty and students in open pedagogy is this opportunity to have that conversation about what does a right mean and what does it mean for uh, creative commons and what what kind of avenue are you starting to build and develop as a result of engaging in an open forum um, and and I know that comes to the basic digital literacy skills but I mean when we start looking at what's been put out there already you know it's obvious that not everybody's 
aware of some of those rights, you know, and aware of what does it mean to contribute back to the public good? And is that something you want to do? Or is that something you feel restricted by or something? So I really feel, um, I think that's a really interesting sort of next phase conversation within the open pedagogy conversation is how are we properly preparing students and those people who are involved in our courses and in our open community to then move into this next generation of publishing and copyright and conversations and to be well informed. So um, yeah, that's just something I've been thinking about lately. And so it's really kind of timely that you bring up the rights. And I see a question we've actually skipped from Tim Robbins uh, for Robin. Uh, he says, I'd be interested in hearing more about assessment. I borrowed your assignment and it was a rousing success, but because it was so raw and such a revisionary process, I felt like I was sort of winging it with the evaluation at times. Um, so everybody meet Tim, um, who is the new uh, sort of Rebus blessed editor of the Open Anthology for Earlier American Literature. So um, it's awesome. I'm so happy to see that project get its its real life right it's just really just an egg now and it's going to hatch i think and tim will hatch it um so that's exciting um so i'll tell you like i am kind of just done with grading all together like i am so done like i'm doing this super amazing interesting work with students who are fired up and excited and it's really pops my bubble um, when I get to the assessment portion. So I just recently took our interdisciplinary studies program to a pass, no pass model, mm -hmm. which I think might help a, a, a bit. <laughs> um, but one of the things I was finding is that a lot of my older grading models, which were very rubric heavy, I always saw rubrics as actually fairly student empowering, um, probably because I was the kind of student who like, really wanted a rubric. Um, but with a lot of this work, I, it's been much harder because I didn't even know what we were doing a lot of times, right? So like, I didn't have rubrics ready to go. And then I was sort of having students do, um, make rubrics, right? And I thought, okay, that'll be a way to handle this. Students can participate in creating rubrics and it can even participate in grading using the rubrics. That's all great. But even that was kind of getting in the way because I just keep going back to my own book writing process. Like you don't always know, like you don't want to grade your book by the things that you set out for yourself on the day you started working on your book. Like that's not the way to do inquiry. So I think a lot of our grading practices are not inquiry based practices and making OER to me is a very inquiry based kind of adventure. So I have to say, um, I have found that grading has been highly de-emphasized in my classes. The students seem less interested in it. They don't talk about it as much. Um, I do hear on the evaluations, I, I used to get like a perfect score for clarity of grading policies. And now I'll get like a 4.7 out of five. Like it's just, it just went down a little bit, um, but it's still fine. I think they're, so, so really, I, I guess, um, what I would say is I'm probably leaning more towards self-assessments now, um, where students are doing more reflective writing. In, in a lot of my classes, I, they are actually almost entirely grading themselves um, based on what they say their learning has been. I also will put out there that I am a tenured full professor with a lot of security that allows me to do these things. I also run a highly innovative program that like that's very much in the ethos of the of you know my faculty who are on my team and the students who sign into this program so it's probably quite different for people who are more a part of um, conventional departments but i i mostly ask them to reflect on their learning at this point and um, in some cases assign themselves literally a numerical number based on what like what kind of numerical scale makes sense to them. I mean, it's, it's craziness, I know. I hope that's helpful. I can't imagine how it would be. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Deb Quintel to Steele uh, regarding students' licensing of rights. 
Um, I agree that's a great idea, Deb says. Does your institution worry about one student later changing his mind about the license and unlicensing his contribution to the whole? No. <laughs> um, we, yeah, that's, that's it. I've thought about this a couple of times and we haven't, we have not signed any contracts or we haven't circulated legally binding documents, things like that. I imagine that we could, but uh, no, I'm not super worried about it. But the other thing is, isn't, I believe that once you license something, you're, it's like, any work you can't retrofit that license right like so they need to be able to um they need to be able to understand what that licensing means from the get-go right I, yeah that's that's my understanding i think i don't feel con so i should maybe parse that question i don't feel concerned about the consequences on the work of someone wanting to revoke a license that they already granted i think that like the ship may have already sailed I would feel some concern about the kind of emotional state of that student or like that feeling of being like betrayed or feeling, hey, I thought, well, I don't want this anymore. And I was coerced into it as a young impression undergraduate and count me out. That would feel really sad to me. And I hope that that doesn't happen. Uh, but it's not a, one of my major worries in the, in the field. But I don't know if that's speaking to the question that was asked. I hope it was sympathetic to the spirit of the question. So we have an ongoing discussion going on about hypothesis and some new features there. Um, Hugh, did you want to speak to that real quick? Yeah, I might. So um, those of you who've used hypothesis as a, it's an annotation tool that sits on top of any web page and it's now integrated into Pressbooks. So you can optionally just turn that on on any Pressbooks instance, I think. Um, and Hypothesis is doing a lot of interesting things around closed private groups, public groups, groups with different kinds of, um, uh, of permissions. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you could, for instance, have something that's open on the web but only your class could see the annotations or open annotations so you can have different kinds of permissions. And even beyond that, uh, we had some great talks last week. Amanda was there at, at the symposium tools OER tools symposium uh, down in California, and the, it, it goes beyond that where it, we may be able to get it so that uh, hypothesis could be enabled on an open stacks book on their website and annotations there would show up on BC campuses version of that textbook. So there's a lot of interesting things coming down the pipe for hypothesis, 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 hypothesis yes. I, I saw a question from, uh, let's see, where was it at? I just lost it. Um, Anita Waltz about the students, how the students authored in press books. Is that okay to answer that one, Liz? Yes, please. So in, in, the, in both of these cases, uh, we trained the whole class on how to author using press books. And Hugh can speak more to this as the mastermind of the software tool, but press books follows essentially the WordPress editing model in that you can have in any number of uh, users or authors with varying kind of cascading levels of privileges. So you could add somebody as an admin, as an editor, as an author, as a contributor or a subscriber. I mean, you can, you could configure those differently, but so what I did was I just said, anybody who wants to work on this text will give you a kind of default level of maximal permissions. And, uh, the students could work on those pieces collaboratively in the sense that there were saved revisions. Every time someone edited a particular part of the book, it would be saved. The one constraint is it's not uh, the, the, the pr Pressbooks follows the WordPress model of each individual node, like a chapter or a part, can only be checked out to one editor or one author at a time. So in Google Docs, you have, the, I mean, many people are used to being able to multiply edit the same document in real time. In Pressbooks, it can be collaboratively edited, but not simultaneously. So we could have 10 people working on the same book as long as they were in different chapters, but say the three co-authors of their chapter would have to coordinate who's in the chapter at any given time editing. But we didn't have very, really any complaints about that. A lot of times I think students probably drafted it elsewhere and then copied it in their press books. And I think some students just drafted it in press books and revised and did everything in press books. We really left it up to them to figure out the workflow that was best for them.
I, I had a question if I'm allowed, mm -hmm. Liz, may I? Yes, you may. Um, so I wanted to elaborate a little bit or ask some questions about um, the ancillary materials. Um, it's a big issue, by the way, in open textbooks. So Rebus Community, our focus is helping faculty largely create the open textbooks. But one of the things that open textbooks don't necessarily have out of the way is all the ancillary materials that tend to come with other um, commercial textbooks. And so this notion of having students participate in the creation of those assessments, quizzes, uh, slide decks, et cetera, that seems to me to be a really interesting way to use um, interaction with the textbook as a mechanism, uh, you know, in this spirit of open to have the, um, whatever, the use of the textbook by students actually be concretely contributing to making it, it better in, in a very substantial way. So I just sort of throw that out as a, as a comment um, inspired by, I think, some of Robin's things. And I wanted to actually ask a follow-up to that. Robin, I see you had a comment in the chat trail about not making those uh, questions public necessarily, with that there was some sort of question about other students seeing them or students from different semesters. I didn't quite understand that. I didn't, something in the chat that you're saying about that? I don't know what Did that you, I think I read that you didn't, or I thought I read that you didn't make the questions that the students wrote public as part of the book, or did I misunderstand? I don't I know may have misunderstood that. what that is. Um, so, I, so um, I don't know. How, yeah, I don't know the thing that you're asking or what you're referring to. Um, I'd but, like to put something out there yeah. too that might help Robin um, answer your question. I, there's two things that are on my mind. There's the open pedagogy in terms of engaging your students. And then there's the, how do we make this textbook attractive for faculty adopters? And then kind of surfacing the questions or not surfacing the questions. I think that's maybe what was on the- yeah. I know what you're talking about. Maybe discussion. you're talking about like, the sort of little stickies about what parts need work or anyway, I, th I think I might know what we're getting at now. Um, yeah, because none of my, I mean, partially because I didn't know about press books until, you know, a year ago or whatever. If I'd known earlier, I'd be so much farther along. Um, but I, none of the books that I've made would I consider adoptable textbooks in the sense that like some of the OpenStax books are adoptable textbooks. So like if somebody was looking for a replacement text for a current textbook, I don't think of any of the books that I've worked on with students as replacement textbooks for mm -hmm. those textbooks. Now, that being said, you could replace a high cost textbook with one of my books. It, you would just be doing a totally different thing, um, which is engaging in the process of bookmaking, which is very different than what happens if you just adopt an OpenStax bio textbook in order to just simply replace. So I think, I think in pitching to faculty, I've been much more interested in thinking really almost about all open textbooks is that I think we undersell open when we talk about simple adoption ever. I think always foregrounding the power of the open license, even if it might take you a couple of years, like use it for two years and do your assessment, right? And then two years later, you're gonna be like, God, chapter five messes my class up every time. I'm gonna just spend you know, <coughs> one day making a new something or other for chapter five even that is a sort of powerful revision of how textbooks function in courses. So I think helping faculty engage with the pedagogy first, or at least you know exactly at the same time as that replacement model of cost savings, um, is is more is more helpful. Um, I would never pitch my open textbooks to anybody who just wanted a really you know perfect perfect textbook. The myth there though, of course, is that like the Heath Anthology of American Literature is a perfect textbook. I mean, uh, James Lowen has a whole book uh, called Lies My Teacher Told Me, which is just 
going through U.S. history textbooks and showing you all of their deep and sometimes highly offensive flaws. And those are in, you know, publishing house textbooks. So I think they're all probably flawed, but I, we, we foreground ours because we see those flaws as the growth area where knowledge changes and moves forward. So a flaw is an open door, I think, for in, in OER. It's um, better to have free and flawed than expensive and flawed, right, Robin? Well, that's true, <laughs> exactly. I don't know I, if that, I, I'm not totally sure if that was what we were I, talking I, about or not. No. Uh, I, have a, I have actually a few on this question. I have a, maybe a relevant example. So a bunch of the work that we're doing, I didn't talk about today is we, uh, I've been working with a number of language departments to develop open language textbooks for foreign language instruction. And mm -hmm. there are a number of less commonly taught languages that UW-Madison has good programs in. And so there are some text, some languages where there is not a commercially available textbook, even if they wanted to adopt it. And so these instructors for 10 years have been developing their own teaching materials, and now we're helping them use Pressbooks to make an interactive textbook. And so one example would be a, the Portuguese textbook. I posted a link to the chat there. This is the most developed, the, further, the one that's furthest along. They took an existing text that had a bunch of worksheets and activities, but that weren't inherently interactive on paper. And we used this plugin called H5P to make a bunch of their formative assessments almost exclusively, but their students will learn a grammatical concept and then they will practice it. And it, they'll get real-time machine-graded feedback on how well they've been able to conjugate this verb with the fill in the blanks activity, or a matching pair uh, flip card activity, or highlight, you have to select all the properly conjugated verbs in this prose block, or they listen to audio and then they have to answer some questions about a dialogue. All those things can live in the web version of this open textbook in a way that they couldn't live. It would have to be either some interactive software or a CD-ROM or something else in the old print copy. That's all built right into the text. Now, that's not going to be, I think, primarily useful for assessment, but it will be for, for like a summative assessment or for grade evaluation. We're working on ways to make that more possible, but it's really awesome for learners, especially like autodidactic learners who are not ac accessing this in a class. You want to learn Portuguese and you want to know how well you're doing? This book has a little robot who's going to tell you how well you conjugated six of these verbs as you just learn, learn about verb conjugation. We think that's a really positive value added, and that's something that can be built into any Pressbooks text. Uh, I'm going to um, finish things off, I think, on that note. And I just want to say, Steele, that uh, I think that's one of the most exciting things. If we think about all of these open textbooks being available on the open web, the ability then to build these other tools is, is super exciting. Um, so, uh, I have, I don't think it's quite a proposal. We, we have this idea that maybe out of these um, office hours, we might try to have something concrete come out of them. <laughs> so the last office hours we did, we were talking about um, MOUs with faculty. So institutions who have open textbook programs uh, often need to have an MOU with their faculty. And the idea was just to get together a few people who'd done that and uh, see if we can draft up uh, a sample one or a, um, a template that anyone can use and adapt as they wish. In the case of this one, I think there's a very interesting set of practices around how best to get students to uh, basically how to use OER as a uh, teaching open pedagogy, etc. I wonder, do you guys think there'd be interest, uh, it's less a question of interest and more a question of time of putting together a little how-to guide um, to talk about some of these things, because I think this is among, you know, the most exciting ways to think about open as being interesting. And I guess really that's for, you know, basically Robin, Steele, Amanda, and anyone who's had, uh, Rajiv, I guess, anyone who's had a lot of experience with, with uh, working with students. Um, yeah, so jump in either on the text or whatever um, in, in the chat. Okay, so we have Amanda and Steele saying yes, so that seems like two pretty high-powered co-editors of, of our new open textbook that will <laughs> cover this. So um, is anyone else actually, if you could just put in the chat, is anyone interested in contributing to that? If we, if we did a, a I, I don't think it would be very long, but maybe a, you know, a few, um, <laughs> okay, Robin says she's not the co-editor, fair enough. Um, Awesome, okay, so so we'll follow up uh, with all of you, and it, again, we'll do it all in the open and publicly about that. I wanna thank um, 
Karen for being a uh, co-host with the host. You did all the work, Q. Liz for- And Liz and Robin. Yeah, and uh, so thanks to Liz and Zoe on my team who helped put all this together. And uh, thanks to Robin, Steele, and Amanda for being our wonderful um, experts in this area. And uh, thank all of you for, for joining. Um, it's been great. And I did record all this. I don't know what's going to happen when I press stop, but I've recorded all the Q, Q and A. So we'll see if we can get that somewhere visible at some point. All righty. Okay, so I think that's it, everyone. Thank you see so you much. See you next time. Okay. Peace.